All right, uh, let's move on. Did you have an opportunity uh, to review, uh, at the request of the state, uh, the crime scene here as it relates to uh, Maggie and Paul? I did, yes, sir. All right. And just very quickly, uh, what are some of the, the types of things that you reviewed in, as part of your uh, process? When I do a reconstruction, I look at the available evidence as I feel it's pertinent to uh, help me answer some questions. And the questions that I, or, or the things I wanted to accomplish from this uh, reconstruction, you can determine sequence, you can determine movement. Uh, a lot of times you can determine the number of, uh, of blows or in the event of a hand-to-hand -hand combat or a uh, firearm was used those kind of things. So I, I examined uh, forensic reports that were issued by law enforcement laboratories. I also examined extensively photographs that were taken on the scene, measurements, that kind of thing, and I also responded to the scene. It was rather close, and I took my own measurements. When you say responded to the scene, when did you first get involved in this case? The end of 2022, and I'm not talking about when the scene was actually going on. I went after the fact and, and did my own measurements. All right. And when you were uh, retained uh, by the state in this case, were you told any particular goal or were you told to just take a fresh look at it and offer your opinions? I was told to look at all of the evidence and determine what I may be helpful on and to uh, use my own judgment objectively, independently, and come up with my own conclusions. All right, let's, uh, let's talk about, uh, if we can, and again, we're gonna have to deal with some of, uh, maybe not the images as much, but deal with some of the, the injuries that, that Maggie and Paul suffered, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Let's, uh, if you could, just remind the jury, uh, what were the injuries that Paul suffered, please? They were, they were very, very severe firearms injuries. Uh, one was a shotgun wound to just a little uh, anatomical left of the midline of the body. One was to the shoulder and it proceeded into the jaw and ultimately into the head. And uh, the, uh, was that the first injury or the second? The first injury was the shotgun wound to the middle of the chest and it was non-fatal. Right. At least not fatal immediately. And then uh, what about the second injury? The second injury was immediate, uh, immediate death. And uh, were you able in reviewing the crime scene evidence to come to any conclusions as to the order in which Paul suffered those gunshot wounds uh, from the shooter? Yes, sir, I was. All right, and please relate that to the jury. My conclusion was that the first non-fatal wound to the midline of the body occurred as Paul was standing uh, with his body canted in the middle of that dog food room, pointed slightly southwest, and the shot entered the midline of his chest, exited his underarm, entered his underarm on, it, on the actual arm, and exited the outside of his arm, and uh, most of those nine pellets proceeded through the back window of that dog food room. He's, he, right, and then just real quick, you said nine pellets. So explain that to the jury why you say nine pellets. That double alt buckshot shot shell contains nine pellets and a, I guess you'd describe it as a styrofoam packing to keep it tight so it doesn't shake. And when that cartridge is expelled out of the end of that barrel, the, the styrofoam packing dissipates or goes its own way and those projectiles continue in the in the correct path. Right. And hold on for me real quick. I want to get a couple things marked. The Elmo, please. Uh, I'm going to show you what's been marked as states 531, 532, and 533, and see if you recognize these particular images.
Yes, sir, I do. All right, and tell the jury just generally what these are, please. These are views of the floor of the feed room and uh, a view from the entrance to the feed room and some digitally placed uh, foot, uh, footprint, not footprints, legs that I placed in there to show Paul's approximate position in that feed room at the time of the shooting. Your Honor, at this time I'd offer for states 531, 532, and 533, I believe, without objection. Objection, Your Honor. There did it. All right, I'm going to put uh, 531 up on the screen here. Make sure we can see it all right. All right. Uh, all right, Dr. Kinsey, uh, you were talking a little bit about Paul's positioning and his location uh, when that first shot happened. And if you could tell the jury your conclusion as to where he was located uh, when, when uh, that shot was fired. And then if you want to, uh, step down and if you could maybe point out uh, what uh, was added to this image to kind of reflect your conclusion in that regard. Thank you. And there's a dowel stick right behind you if you want to use that. Okay, as you see here, those are the digital legs that I placed there showing Paul's approximate position as he was standing when he had the first gunshot wound. Here along the floor, what you see are passive or 90 degree blood droplets. And when blood, uh, you can tell a lot of, from the direction of blood by the way it strikes an object. Blood has a cohesive factor. It's viscous and you probably heard that term before with the motor oil for your car. It's thicker than water. And the thing that causes that blood droplet to change shape is the friction and the direction and how much force was used. Well, a 90 degree drop just is exactly that. It's perpendicular to the ground. So these 90 degree drops right here tell me that Paul was standing there for a moment. Can't tell you how long, but those drops were running down from that wound on his arm, more than likely his arm, because his chest area had a shirt on it, and it takes a little while for that blood to make it through the shirt, but it'll run down the outside of your arm and drip off your fingers. And you can see these 90 degree droplets here, here, and then they actually lead to the door. You can follow the path to the door. He's not moving very fast because most of them are almost perfectly circular or 90 degrees. Had he been moving real fast, you could see some directionality in him, a tail, because the tail always tells you the direction with a, with a blood drop. So I know he was moving slowly, and I know he was standing in the middle of this room for some time after, he, after the first shotgun wound. All right, and uh, approximately how far was Paul inside the feed room. Can you describe a little bit about the dimensions of the feed room and your conclusion as to how far within the room Paul was when he was struck by that first blast? Yes, sir. Well, the feed room is 10 foot deep by my own calculations and by looking at the uh, other sketches. And where you see his feet here is just on the other side of the halfway point. So I went, you know, I, I'm guessing because I, I have no way of running a tape measure because when I went there, everything was moved. But this door is 36 inches, and it's approximately a foot and a half, two foot past the door. So that's how I come up with that determination. And he's just on the other side of the midpoint of that 10 foot room. Which is about how far from the doorway? Five foot. All right. And uh, I'm going to show you what's been marked as uh, 534, uh, state 534, and see if you recognize that. I do. Yes, sir. All right, and tell the jury what that is real quick. That is uh, a general view from outside the feed room that was taken at the time the crime scene was originally processed. And I added a digital enhanced arrow showing the, the reader or the viewer the direction of the shot path. All right, this time I offer a state 534 and Okay. All right, um, I'm gonna put 534 up on the screen. And uh, if you would, just uh, show that arrow that you're talking about that's been added to this image. Yes, sir. Right here. All right. And then, as well, just show generally where those blood spots are. It's not the best image in the world, but where those blood spots are that led to your conclusion about Paul's location within the feed room when the first blast struck him. 
The placard hasn't been moved, although it's hard to see the droplets. And of course, I didn't add the legs to this, but just on the other side of that placard, and then you have uh, here a quantity of 90 degree blood droplets with a partial footwear impression in it. And then you can follow the blood droplets to the door. Going back to States 531, Again, point out to the jury, if you would, the, uh, the sort of the digitally uh, added feet that you had uh, added. All right. And if we would, if you could, just if that's the feed room doorway, uh, can you just sort of position me, in your opinion, how Paul was standing when that first blast uh, happened? That's the doorway coming in? The, yes. About right here. All right. And. Um, let me ask you this, in, in your review of the evidence and the available crime scene uh, evidence that you've reviewed, uh, in your expert opinion, is there any way that Paul's arms were raised when he, shot, when he suffered that first blast to the chest? I see no possible way his arms were up when he suffered that first shotgun wound. And can you explain the, the basis for your conclusion to the jury in that regard? <coughs> yes, sir, I can. <coughs> the shot pellet real close because they stayed together. They went in as one, as a unit, and then they did what a shot pellet does. They separated once they struck the skin and made the entry. Run along inside his body cavity and exited his underarm. If his arms would have been up, he would have had no entry wounds on the bottom of his arm and then more exit wounds on the outside. He had over 20 entry and exit wounds and he's only got nine pellets. So the only way the math works out is if his arm was down. And, and additionally, the wide stopped and was under his arm. Had his arms been up, in my opinion, that wide would have went on and exited his body because it's only plastic. It doesn't take as much resistance to stop that wide as it does a shot pellet. And the wide stopped. It was right, you could grab it with your fingers if you would have been medical personnel and needed to if it was right there. All right, um, and, and let me ask you this. Uh, do you have uh, a, a lot of general experience with firearms? I do. I'm a firearms instructor for uh, handguns, shotguns, patrol rifles, subguns, and fully automatic patrol rifles. Everything but a uh, precision rifle. All right, and you, when you say an instructor, where is that? I'm certified and I have credentials through the South Carolina Criminal Justice Academy. I've also been certified as an NRA law enforcement instructor and I currently have a CWP endorsement to teach concealed weapon permits from the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division. And you testified how many uh, buckshot are typically in your average buckshot show? According to the literature and according to my experience, there are nine in that particular buckshot. Did you see uh, any evidence, I think you've already mentioned this, but did you see any evidence from the crime scene as to what happened to some of those pellets uh, as Paul was struck as they continued on? Yes, sir, I did. They exited on through the back window. All right, and I'm gonna show what's already been admitted as 532 and put that up on the screen. And if you could uh, describe to the jury uh, what you're talking about in that regard, please. This is that window at the back of the feed room, and you can see the shot shell pellet defects here as they went through the window and continued on their path. Those are kind of big holes. Are those consistent, though, with uh, buckshot pellet striking that? Yes, sir, they are, and some are bigger than others because it, it, it's just the, the makeup of glass. I mean, sometimes you'll get a, one individual hole, and sometimes it'll take out you know, a large portion, so I have have no way to know that. All right. And uh, just real quick, I've got uh, 533. I'm going to put that up on the screen. And again, is that just a close up of where Paul was standing, uh, about five feet or so inside that feed room? It is, yes, sir. Based on your review of the blood evidence that you saw? Yes, sir. And here are the partial footwear impressions. And here you can see the 90 degree blood droplets and, and some other biological materials. All right. And in your conclusion, what's the most, just to, again, uh, what's the most likely explanation for those 90 degree blood drops? So how is that physically happening? It's the arm wound. Uh, even though it was non-fatal, there's less restriction from clothing or anything else on the arm. You know, here you've got the t-shirt that's got to completely saturate before it gets to the bottom and drops. But here on the arm, you, you've got nothing. So once those pellets exited, entered, and exited again, that blood's free 
free pouring, or not free pouring, free running down his arm and then they'll drip off the ends of your fingers. Uh, one thing I, I want to ask you about is uh, you've testified as to your conclusions as to the position of Paul when that first shot uh, struck him. Um, is there anything about the entrance wing itself that supports your conclusion as to the shape of the entrance wing? Yes, it's oblong instead of completely round. And had he been standing facing that door and took that double lock buck shot to the middle of the chest, I've seen it dozens and dozens of times. Instead of coming out this side, a, a shot shell or a, a, a projectile doesn't make a 90 degree right. Generally, it's gonna follow the same path unless it hits something hard enough to make it ricochet. It would have went on through his body. It still would have exited the window. It just wouldn't have done the damage to his arm and his underarm. So he had to be canted in this direction. And the wound is not perfectly circular. It's more oblong, which tells you that he was canted to some degree. All right. Um, in your review of the crime scene evidence, uh, did you uh, come to any conclusion about the location of the shooter uh, when that first buckshot blast struck Paul in his chest? It would be hard to say exact, but I can say to a bare minimum, the breach of the shotgun, because I don't have the shotgun, I don't know the length of the barrel, that kind of thing, or I could run it from the door, but the breach of the shotgun, where it ejects the shot shell casing after it fires, was somewhere inside the door, because had it been on the other side of the door, the shot shell would have been located outside. So depending on the length of the shotgun, at least I can say the, the ejection port was inside the, the door of the shed. All right, and then the shooter, I have this image up here, which I apologize, is States 534, and can you uh, kind of illustrate what you're talking about to the jury using that image? Yes, sir. The breach, the ejection port, where you load and unload that shotgun, which is a little less than midpoint from the shooter, was inside this door frame, at least to some degree inside. Right. And where uh, were the um, expended shot shells found in, on this crime scene? According to the photographs and the original crime scene behind this door. Right. And uh, is that consistent with your uh, review of the evidence? Does that support your review of the evidence that you just, uh, that conclusion you just related to the jury? Very easily, this is, if you look, this room is kind of cluttered. And I measured that door myself. It had been pressure washed, but the same door found the same shot shell uh, pellet defects in that door. An inch and a half at the bottom of the door, that's plenty of room for a shot shell to bounce and roll under the door. So I have no reason to believe it didn't end up there because of the location of the shooting. All right. Um. Right, let me get a couple other things marked. You can kind of head back to your home base, so now let me just get these marked real quick. What's been marked is 535, 536, 537, and 538 states exhibits, and see if you generally recognize those images. Yes, sir, I do. All right, and generally explain to the jury what these images are, and then we'll talk about them specifically. Those are images at the door that I've added some vis visual enhancements to help the reader understand the flight path of the second shot. 
and the, the different uh, elements that I looked at in determining where the shooter was for the second or the fatal shot to Paul. All right. Your Honor, this time I'd offer states 535, 536, 537, and 538 in evidence, I believe, without objection. No objection. Yeah, admit it. All right. <clears throat> Let's look first at uh, 535. And, and before we get to that, uh, generally describe again to the jury uh, um, your conclusion as to that second injury suffered by Paul, the fatal shot as you've described it. Well, the first thing is, once Paul received that second shot, he never walked again. He never made any movement. Any movement he made was involuntary, and it was due to gravity, pulling his body down to the ground. When you sustain an injury to your brain like that, that ceases all movement. So he was found outside the feed door. He fell over forward after sustaining that movement. Some, some wounds are fatal later. You can actually see someone that receives a fatal wound and they, I've seen them run 100 yards. Uh, they can move for a little while. This is not that type of wound. Once he received this wound, it ceased all movement. Right. And did you, uh, I'm gonna put attachment, excuse me, uh, stage 535 up on the screen and uh, tell the jury what this particular image reflects, please. Yes, sir, if you can look at the green funnel that I've added just visually, if you look at that green funnel, that is approximately the shot shell path, the shot path from the shot shell after it uh, did the injuries to Paul or the direction of the shot from the shot shell. And I determined that by shot shell pellet defects that are still in the door, even though the door had been cleaned, I went and looked at it myself, run my own measurements, took the width of the door. I took Paul's approximate height. Uh, it's listed as several different things. DMV shows him at 5'6". The pathologist listed him, I believe, at 5'9". So I had to split the difference. I went somewhere in the middle. Then I deducted the distance between the top of your head and the top of your shoulder. So I took another foot off. Then I took the width of the door, and it was one other thing I looked at, and that was a void pattern that's on the door frame of the door. A void pattern is caused by something being there when the blood and biological materials are, are uh, let, let, we call it a bloodletting from the wound, and there's a void pattern, which tells me something was in that way, and because of the narrow door, in my opinion, it was Paul. So that's what caused that void pattern on that door. So I used all of that, and I used a dowel rod, and I used a protractor on the uh, doorknob side of that door frame, and I ran it up, and that's what helped me establish the angle of that shot pattern. All right, and we're going to uh, use the images to kind of talk about that a little bit more specifically, but quickly I want to show you 539 and 540 and see if you recognize these images. Yes, sir, I do. Uh, 540 is my photograph when I visited the scene. And 539 is also my photograph, and it shows uh, that top hinge of that door is approximately 72 inches at the top of the, at the, top of the hinge. All right. Your Honor, this time I'd move uh, into evidence of belief without objection, states 539 and 540. No objection. Admit it. All right, let's, uh, if you could, I'm going to ask you to step down again. I know I just sent you back there, but uh, come on down. I'm going to put 539 up on the screen, and uh, if you could. <coughs> Tell me what this image reflects, if you would, please. Yes, sir. These are 36 inch standard yellow yardsticks. We use them to measure uh, certain things. And it right here is the top of the top hinge. It's a three hinge door. And this is the top of the hinge. And then four inches above this are where those shot pellet defects were that I used to uh, figure out my angle. All right, and looking at 540. Who took this particular image? I took this image. So this would have been long after this would have been long after the actual event occurred. Is that correct? This was uh, last December. Yes, sir. All right. And tell the jury what this image reflects. You can still see the pellet defects in the door, and this is the approximate 
center of it here. So that's four inches above 72. That's approximately 76 inches on an 80 inch door. I'm going to show you states 536 and explain to the jury what this is and in particular how that's relevant to uh, your conclusion about uh, the angle in which Paul suffered the fatal head wound. This is the original crime scene pictures. And this is where the pellets took their path. This is where they struck and did damage to the door. And you can actually still see the dents that are documented in my photograph. You can see them in the original crime scene. This is the concentration of blood that's caused by the brain exiting Paul's body in the path of the shot shells. And then you also have biological material, hair and blood, here at the top of the door frame. And that's where I drew my conclusion. At some time, those body parts made contact with these sections of the door. And my opinion is that it hit here, hit here, and then landed on the sidewalk. Looking at States 537, can you explain what the jury's seeing in this image and how it relates to your opinion about the manner in which Paul suffered that fatal wound? I can. With a major blood letting, especially. Dr. Kinson, let me ask you to I'm gonna move this podium and I actually ask you to step back just a, a hair so that uh, the jurors over here can see what you're, what you're saying. Yes, sir. With a shotgun wound, you know, you, you've got hundreds, well, not hundreds, you've got over 800 pellets that are making damage. It's not like a projectile, a single projectile from a pistol or a rifle. So there's mass damage and it, it throws body fluids and blood in several different directions, but they follow the path. When I mentioned that it was a void pattern, this is the last blood drop. You can see it in the photograph that I can see. And it's, uh, it's approximately five foot right there. And this is not green tape. That is a digital effect I put on the photograph to show the, uh, the void I was talking about. So at some time, it's my opinion that Paul was up against that door or real close to that door to keep that blood from striking the door at the point in time that he was shot. All right, and the green tape reflects that, that blood pad or that uh, void area that is consistent with uh, Paul blocking that area, is that correct? Yes, sir, digital tape, it's not really tape. All right, well, yes, sir. And so that's, that's been added to- Yes, sir. Okay, to illustrate your opinion, correct? Yes, sir. All right, and then uh, 538, I'm gonna show you this image, and again, uh, if you can point out what's been added and, and how this uh, relates to the conclusion that you're offering to the jury. Yes, sir. One thing that I looked at to determine that it happened in the doorway and a little bit outside the doorway, more outside than inside, you don't just look for the presence of biological material in blood, you look for the absence of biological material in blood. Here at the top, it didn't have a scale or a ruler, so I can't tell you exactly, but looking at some of these other objects, I was able to scale it approximately four inches up here. You have a void. So I know that it happened, the, the second wound happened far enough outside of that door frame that the actual frame kept the biological material from hitting at the very top, right here. I also looked at these items. Uh, you got some medication, uh, canine medication or some cleaning materials and that kind of thing up here. You can see all the spatter at the front of those containers. And then we got what I call a demarcation line right here, here, and I drew it through most of these cans. And that separates the blood, the blood contaminated area and the clean area. So that tells me that it was at least forward of the angle on those containers. And that's why I believe he was shot the second wound happened just outside the door frame, but his feet were probably still in the door frame. All right, and just quickly point to the jury, we can, can we see part of the door, door frame in this particular image? You can, yes sir, right here. All right, um, once, uh, and going back now to States 535, and just for the record, we were just looking at States 538 and 537, uh, going back to States 535, uh, did you reach a conclusion as to the location of the shooter on that second fatal shot that Paul suffered to his head? Yes, sir, I did. All right, and explain that to the jury, if you would, please. The shooter was right here. If you're facing that door, to the right of the doorway, outside. 
And um, would you have expected there to be uh, in that particular range uh, any sort of uh, biological evidence in that area uh, in proximity to the shooter? Yes, sir, I would. Would the door frame have potentially blocked any of that as well? It would block some, and, and just depending on the positioning, how much of the body of the shooter was exposed. Because, uh, you know, once you have that kind of catastrophic injury, it's real, real, real fine blood, blood particles and, and, and biological fluids that go in all directions. And the closer the shooter was, to the muzzle, to the exit end of that firearm, the more stuff you would expect. Um, let me ask you this. In your uh, expert opinion, is there any way that Paul's fatal head injury came from the top in a contact fashion or a close fashion? No, sir. I see no possible way for that. And explain your conclusion in that regard to the jury, please. What factors weigh against that in your expert opinion? Well, number one, I don't know of a way to mimic this blood evidence on this door, that pattern where that shot traveled through Paul's shoulder into his jaw, into his brain, and then took a, a path up and placed the biological material here at the top of the door. If he was shot in the head, then you'd have biological material out here on the ground or at least going down, you know, on the sidewalk in front of him. And it would be different than just free pouring blood. You would see this pattern and you would see those high velocity blood droplets there on the ground. And plus the shooter would have to be on the roof to shoot down into him, but you wouldn't have this on the door. In your expert opinion, did you see any support uh, or evidence in this crime scene that could support that the injuries suffered by Paul were in any manner a suicide or self-inflicted? I, I don't see the possibility knowing that it's not a contact shotgun wound and I'm, I'm fairly strong and I'm, I'm bigger than Paul was and I don't know of any way you could hold that shotgun out and, and shoot yourself in that direction at that angle and put that biological material on top of that door like that. I, I don't think it's possible. Okay. All right, thank you. All right, uh, I hate to keep sending you back and forth, but I'm going to send you back one more time. Um. Now, let me ask you this. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, the second wound, the fatal wound that Paul suffered to his head was that buckshot or was that birdshot? The second wound was birdshot. All right, and can you describe to the jury the difference between the, the composition of a buckshot round as it relates to the pellets and a birdshot round? Yes, sir, I can. All right, please do that. With buckshot, you've got a, a number of larger pellets, uh, approximately 30, 36 caliber pellets, and you've got fewer of them. They're, they're made for bringing down larger game. So uh, in, in the typical double op buckshot, you're going to have nine pellets. In your typical uh, number two, and it's called many things, you know, bur the typical person calls it bird shot, bird shot, chill shot, steel shot, coated shot. I've heard it called many things, so I just typically call it bird shot. But in this particular shot, there's approximately 150 to 156 pellets in that dry lock shot shell. So that's the difference. With the buck shots, you've got fewer and they're larger. And with the bird shot, you've got many and, and they're greater. They're for bringing down winged animals, squirrels, uh, rabbits, dove, quail, uh, turkey, duck. I mean, just depending on the number shot, that, that's what that's for. All right, and about how many approximately bird shot uh, might be in an average uh, shotgun shell? The literature says that it's 156 in a dry lock. I cut one open and I only counted 150, but that may have been human error. Around 150. Yes, sir. Uh, in your expert opinion, uh, when you have birdshot, is, is there a forensic value to collecting every single pellet, or, or can you explain those concepts to the jury when you're dealing with birdshot? I always try to collect enough that the firearms examiner can weigh it, 
and he can have a good representative sample of what was used to cause this injury. With a projectile or a bullet, you have what's called lands and grooves, markings, rifling, some people call it rifling, and it's caused from that projectile spinning as it goes down the barrel. You don't have that in a shotgun. And a pellet is so small that you couldn't, probably couldn't find it if you could have it in a shotgun. So in my opinion, there's no forensic value as long as you have enough to determine what type of shot or what type of shell and the weight of it. In your opinion, uh, was the, and you've talked about this, but was the shooter um, when that fatal shot was fired uh, inside or outside of that door frame? The second shot? The second shot. Yes, yes sir. It was outside the door frame. All right. And where was that second shot shell located? It was also located under the door. All right. And uh, is that still consistent with your opinion? Absolutely. And can you explain that to the jury, please? Yes, sir. Like I mentioned earlier, the ejection port on a shotgun typically, now there are left-handed <laughs> shotguns, but typically the majority of shotguns, the ejection port is on the right side. So as long as that shooter had it at an angle and had that ejection port pointed toward the door, even just the least little bit, that would give plenty of opportunity for that shot shell to be ejected and go inside that door. All right. I know I just sent you back. I'm going to bring you back down. I'm sorry. Uh, before we move on from Paul, I, I would, and if you could just use me as a mannequin, but can you uh, uh, sort of describe to me your conclusions about the positioning of, the, of Paul when he suffered that fatal head wound and, uh, and, and just how the, the trajectory of that wound uh, and that shot as you've uh, described and as is supported by the evidence as you see it. Can I describe it and, yes. and demonstrate? Can yes, please. So the jurors can see me. Uh, the second wound, as I mentioned, went in his arm and caused a, a, an injury here, a, a large entrance, exit, entrance, and then of course exit here. So it had to be typically with the kind of non-fatal wound Paul uh, suffered to his chest and his arm. It's my belief that now his five foot eight frame is dipping or favoring that arm because as you know, that's, that's over 20 something entrances and exits. I believe it would have hurt him. I believe he would have been in pain and I believe he would have been somewhat affected. And the reason I believe that is because I've got the 90 degree blood drops moving really, really slow. If he wasn't feeling it, or if it hadn't affected him in some way, I believe his youthfulness would have allowed him to get out of there faster. But he's moving real slow to the door. So that's going to drop that angle just a couple inches. And I can demonstrate. All right. And if we can make sure that juror can see. Yes, sir. Absolutely. All right. <clears throat> That wound went in to <laughs> approximately right here. It traveled in, out, in, and out in a straight line. In a straight line. Shot always goes in a straight line. And then when you're pressing the dial stick there, you're showing the trajectory of the wound, not implying that was a contact wound. Is that no, correct? sir, I'm not. I'm, I'm not implying it's contact. I'm just showing the, the level of the wound. All right. While I'm thinking about it, uh, the, the wound to uh, Paul's chest, did it show evidence of stippling? It did. Yes, sir. All right. And just very quickly, what is stippling? Commonly referred to as tattooing. It's particles and, and material that's in that shell that don't burn up because it's superheated at, at the time that the powder charge ignites, it doesn't explode, it ignites and burns rapidly. And that's unburnt particles of, of powder and other contents of that shell. They're hot and when they hit the body, they cause stippling or in the old days they called it tattooing. And, and that's basically what it is. It works as an ink. Looking at uh, this particular image, uh, Paul's about five feet in the feed room when he suffers the first wound, correct? Yes, sir, that is correct. And then he moves towards the door, is that correct? That is correct. And suffers the second one somewhere near the door frame on the inside of it. Yes, correct? sir, with his shoulder just outside that door frame. And when he suffers that second one, what happens to Paul? He falls immediately. And where does he fall? 
he falls outside the feed room. All right, um, let's move on uh, now and let's talk a little bit, if we can, about uh, the injuries to Maggie Murdoch. And if you could start out by reminding the jury uh, of the injuries that she suffered, and then let's talk about your conclusions as to the manner and the order in which those were suffered. Yes, sir. All right, so if you could just uh, remind us again of those injuries, and if you could go ahead and, and describe them in the order that your expert opinion they were suffered. Yes, sir. Ms. Maggie Murdoch suffered three non-fatal injuries from a firearm. One was through her wrist, one was her left uh, upper thigh above the knee, one was at her abdomen here and it exited somewhere around her kidneys. Now I'm not that kind of doctor, I can't tell you all the damage it did inside, all those organs and things, but it ran a straight line through her body. This one on her left leg and this one on her midsection were approximately the same angle and they were really, really close in distance. One uh, had stippling that, that said that it was a, a foot closer than the other, but that would probably fit. This was either a total separate non-fatal wound or it could have been a continuation of one of the two fatal wounds. Her fatal wounds were she had an abrasion or a burn on the left side of her abdomen from the outside in. That bullet followed a straight path. It entered the end of her breast and did extensive <coughs> damage to the end of her breast. Entered her left jaw, side of her face area, and went into her brain. That's the first fatal injury. And it was immediate and she dropped right where she was at. I saw no evidence that her body had been manipulated, moved, or rolled over. The second fatal injury was down into her head, and it actually did what in, in, in the day they call a keyhole injury just from appearances. The entrance and exit in the top of her head were so close it made one big injury, and then it entered into her upper shoulders and went down into her body. That would have also been a fatal wound, but it was second. In, in my opinion, that one came second. All right, let's, uh, let's talk about that a little bit in a little bit more detail. Those first two wounds uh, that, uh, that you described, uh, you believe those are the first two wounds she suffered? Yes, sir, and possibly three. I can't tell you much about this because the arm could have been moving or it could have been here. There's All right, well, let's talk about the thigh wound and the abdomen wound. Can you... Did you have any conclusions about uh, the, the location of the shooter as those two wounds were, were uh, um, suffered? Yes, sir, I did. All right, and explain that to the jury if you would, please. Uh, a little bit more, right there. All right, left leg out a little bit. About here and here. Here and here. And in your opinion, were those two shots fired at, at a, in fairly quick succession or around the same time? I think it would have been really, really difficult to get a similar angle if they weren't. Uh, all the shooter had to do is raise the weapon or lower the weapon and you're still on the same plane. And did uh, those wounds to the abdomen and to the thigh uh, reflect the presence of stippling? They did. And what does that indicate to you about the distance between Maggie and the shooter when those wounds were suffered? I guess four or five feet. Okay. Fairly close? Yes, sir. All right. And after those two uh, wounds were suffered, and again, we'll, we'll put aside the wrist wound for, for a bit, uh, what would have happened after that in your expert opinion? In my opinion, at bare minimum, she would have been over, she would have been in pain. I believe sometime in close proximity, she fell to the ground and that's when the first fatal wound was delivered. Would she have been prone on the ground or still somewhat raised by the ground or in a bent over position when that first fatal wound was suffered? In my opinion, from the angle she would have been on her knees and had at least one hand on the ground. Those first two shots, uh, well, let me ask you this. Uh, there were obviously six shell, uh, shell cases that of 300 blackout that were used to murder uh, Maggie Murdoch found at the scene. Is that correct? That is correct. Explain to the jury, is there, what conclusions, if any, can you draw about the location of those shell cases, uh, if anything? Explain that to the jury a little bit. 
Once again, just like with the shotgun, I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but I don't think there are many left-handed AR, AR platforms. So generally speaking, the ejection ports could be on the right side. I own seven. Uh, some of them throw it the, sh the shell case in a little bit forward. Some throw it a little bit back. Some throw it perfect 90 degrees to the ejection port. If they were always uniform where they come out, if you go target practice, you could place a bucket there and all your shell casings would drop in the bucket. You wouldn't have to bend over and pick up your shell cases. Unfortunately, that's not the real world. So I don't put a lot into that unless I have the actual weapon and we can test the weapon with the same ammunition and you can generally get an idea uh, where that shell case is gonna go. So no, sir, I don't pay a lot of attention to it and I definitely don't think the sequence of from one end to the other or from this end to this end means that's necessarily the movement of the shooter. Gotcha. All right, um, you said that when she shoved, suffered that first fatal wound, in your opinion, I mean, she would have bent over and, and perhaps been on her hands and knees, is that correct? Yes, sir. All right, I'm gonna get down on my hands and knees and if you could come around here and kind of show me where the trajectory of that wound would have gone, uh, the first wound that uh, was fatal for Megan Murdoch. I guess you can come yes. behind me. Yes, sir. All right. Right there. The shooter was right here, approximately right here. All right, and show us the trajectory as it went uh, through Maggie into her brain. Yes, it burned or grazed her stomach outside to inside, went through the end of her breast, into her jaw, and then into her brain. Okay. And what would have been the effect on her once that shot was suffered? She would have immediately fell down with the front of her body. All right. And, and that is the position her arms were in the original crime scene photograph. And while I'm down here so I don't have to get up again, tell me about the fatal shot and the positioning of the shooter as the evidence indicates to you. The second shot was not as close, but it still wasn't a long distance. <coughs> it was approximately here into the crown of the head. And uh, use the dowel stick to show that injury that Maggie suffered. In, out, in, in that line. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> you need to go to the drop cleaner after this. <laughs> All right. Um, the first shot, uh, the first fatal shot, that would have immediately been fatal. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, the second shot uh, also would have been fatal had she still been living, but in your opinion, she was not at that point. Is that correct? Yes, sir. All right. Um, well, she may have had a sign of life, but there was no movement. She was not capable of any movement at that time. All right. Uh, go ahead and have a seat for me. Of course, as soon as I tell, say that to you, I'm sure probably going to have to get back up. Um, <coughs> Let me talk about something else real quick before we come back to this. Right, I'm going to show you what's been marked as States 541 and see if you recognize this document. Yes, sir, I do. All right, tell the jury generally what this document is, please. That is a comparison and presentation that I put together over an unidentified impression on Miss Maggie Murdoch's left calf. Okay. Your Honor, this time I would move uh, State 541 into evidence uh, under seal. Objection. Submit without objection. If we could uh, make sure the monitors are secure, please. All right, 
Uh, I'm gonna. Uh, are all the monitors secured? We're good. I'm gonna put uh, states 541 up on the screen. I'm sorry. I got the thumbs up for TV, correct? All right. Moving to uh, 541 and putting it up on the screen. Uh, if you could tell me, first of all, what, what do we see here uh, before we get to your analysis on this particular issue? This is a general photograph of an impression on Miss Maggie Murdoch's left calf. Okay. And uh, do we also see uh, a wound on this particular, in this per picture? You can see the exit wound from that thigh wound that I described earlier. All right, and what, if anything, uh, d did you notice about or conclude from uh, the sort of the blood pattern on, on the back of her thigh there? She stood a little while. I can't tell you how much time, just like with Paul, but she was standing after she suffered that thigh wound because the blood is running down the leg and gravity always pulls it to the earth. All right, and then, uh, you know, I sent you back there. I'm going to just bring you back on down. I'm sorry about that. Bring the stick. Uh, if you would, and again, make sure you're out of the way of, of the jurors. Um, was there any sort of a mark or any sort of mud mark on, uh, on the back of her leg? Yes, sir, it was. All right, and point that out to the jury, please. Right here, an unknown impression on her leg. Okay, and did you engage in an analysis of that particular impression? I did, yes, sir. All right, you just stay there. I think it's probably easier than sending you back. I'm going to move to the next slide. And just tell me what this is, if you would, please. That is the same impression, unknown impression. I've just cropped everything out so you can concentrate on the actual impression. All right. Moving on to the third page of this exhibit. What is this? This is a side-by-side all-terrain vehicle that was in close proximity to Miss Maggie Murdoch's body, where, where she, her final final spot where they located her, and this is in close proximity to where she was located. All right, stand by for me real quick. I'm gonna show you what's previously been admitted into evidence as state 70 and state 71. And can you tell me what these images reflect? That is that Polaris ATV side-by-side -side that I mentioned. All right, and generally remind the jury where this was located. Miss Murdoch was, was laying face down. That was to her left underneath uh, a uh, overhang or, or a, uh, I don't know what you call it, a, a shed that was attached to that airplane hangar. A lean-to, that's the word I was trying to think of. All right. And do you see any, 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 any indication of any biological material in, in uh, the crimes and images that were taken of that Polaris? That was my first indicator. That's what made me concentrate on a specific tire. Yes, sir. Right. And let me see how washed out that is, if I can maybe fix it. And can you point out an example of what you're talking about on that image? Yes, sir, I can. And I can bring you the original image if that's better. Right here, we've got some kind of biological material. And, I, and I'll tell you the reason I believe that to be so. Like I said, blood has a viscosity or a cohesive factor to it. That's why a blood drop stays together. You know, if, I, if you throw a drop of water on a tire, what's going to happen? It's going to run down. But here, 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 and actually here on the front of that four-wheeler, in my opinion, that's some type of biological material. All right. I'm going to do one other thing. Let me slide by you real quick. All right, looking now at Defense 29. Again, if you could, just uh, this is the uh, feed room right here, is that right? Yes, sir. 
And just if you could, just point to the general location of this ATV and where it was located in the crime scene. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right here in this area. Okay. All right. And that would be, uh, again, on this, this is not to scale, but that would be at least on this diagram where Maggie was. Is that correct? Yes, sir. That's our approximate location. All right. All right. All right, <coughs> looking at uh, going back to this particular slide and, uh, and your, uh, your analysis of this tire, uh, if you would exp explain a little bit about what you see here and what an examiner looks at in looking at sort of this particular tire as it relates to your analysis. Yes, sir. What we look at it as footwear and tire tread or tire track examiners, we look at the actual tread pattern and design of that tire or that shoe. And there are a couple different uh, conclusions you can come up with. We compare known and unknown. It's not like you see on TV where you take a picture of a shoe and feed it into a computer. Some people have footwear, databases, but it still has to be examined by a human. Uh, there's no magic machine. If it is, I've never seen it. What we look at, we look at the dimensions of the tread pattern. We look at the shape. The sole, the outsole design, the tread design, the measurements, and we try to find uh, class characteristics. That's shape, size, sometimes depth, or, or the, the physical uh, properties included in that pattern. And then to make a complete identification, that's a class characteristic. That's saying there's an association, either this shoe or this tire could have made this unknown impression or another one just like it could have made this unknown impression. So that's a class or an association. Then you've got an identification. That's where you say to the exclusion of all others, this shoe or this tire made this print. Now to, to make an actual complete identification to the exclusion of all others, you've either got to have a, you got to have what's called a random unique characteristic a thumbtack in the bottom of someone's shoe, bubble gum, damage to the tread pattern on that tire. You know, you hit something and it cut a tread pattern. So that's pretty difficult uh, unless you have the actual tire, the actual shoe, and then you take it and compare it to the unknown. And what you'll do is take that tire and you, three-dimensional comparisons are always better than two-dimensional. Two-dimensional is a photograph. You can't tell depth. If you have the actual cast of that footprint or that tire, now you've got three-dimensional. You've got the, the width, the length, and the depth. So it's a little bit better to have a three-dimensional to compare with, but you can do a lot with the two-dimensional. If you can get it scaled to the size, you can associate it with another thing. You're looking for them unique, random characteristics. They call them accidentals. It's something that happens by accident just because of the way you walk, the way you drive, what you might hit. And that's what you look at when you, when you do a tire or footwear in impression uh, analysis. All right, I'm gonna move on now to the next page in uh, your exhibit and uh, tell the jury what these two images are, please. Yes, sir, this is the unknown impression on Miss Maggie Murdoch's left calf. And this is the photograph of the known front driver's side tire of that side-by-side. -side. All right, and when you were starting to compare these two, did you have to make any account for the relationship of Maggie's thigh and this ATV tire? I did. Now explain that to the jury, please. Just like if you're driving in your car and an ambulance comes up behind you and you look in the rear view mirror, you can read ambulance. But if you look at the front of that ambulance, it's written backwards because you're looking through a mirror. Well, with a shoe, a tire, or Miss Maggie Murdoch's leg, you can't see through her leg. You can't see through the tire. So you have to flip one of them or the other. So flipping the tire, in my opinion, because it has some characteristics on it that I wanted the reader to be able to look at, I chose to flip the impression on her leg to do the comparison. So 
because unless you do footwear and tire tread examinations, you're not going to be able to look at something in reverse and find those points. So this is the, uh, the original orientation, is that correct? It is, yes sir. And then flipping over to uh, your next slide, that's uh, where you've reversed the image, is that correct? Same photograph. I just pulled it over in the old days with 35 millimeter film, and I'm from the old days, we just flipped the negative. That's all you had to do. It's a little bit more complicated in the digital world, but not that hard to do. But this is a direct uh, representation. It's just in reverse. All right. Continuing on as we go through uh, your analysis, what does this reflect? This is just a side by side so you could understand the orientation here, 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 and here. Those are the two treads that we're, we're talking about now. All right. And by the way, those on the tire are the only treads at that level on her calf that I believe needed to be examined. All right, and again, these are just additional images uh, illustrating uh, the, what you were focusing on in your analysis? Yes, sir. Okay. And then this one right here. Yes, sir. That's a side-by-side -side view once again with all the background cut out of it. All right. And then the final one is this, uh, uh, explain this to the jury and how this supports your opinion. This is my actual comparison and we use a process called ACE-V where you analyze, compare, evaluate, and verify. It's a peer-reviewed process. I never go by just my results. I always have another competent examiner with like experience and, and like skills look at my work because if you're gonna make a mistake, that's where the mistake's found. You don't wanna put a conclusion out for something important and you miss that. And that is a very important process in the examination world that you use peer reviewed process. You have someone else look at it. And so what I do, so that person and the jury in the court, your honor. So that person can look at these details. I've got a markup here showing some unique random characteristics that I've used, but I also put the actual impression there so you can make your own decision. I didn't want to uh, look like I was being deceptive and put enhancements in there and point things. You can look at it and make your own conclusion, but I wanted to uh, Put it right next to mine so you know I'm, I'm being straight here or you can make your own opinion. All right, very quickly, is it your expert opinion that this mark on the back of Maggie's leg is a tire impression uh, and not anything else? That is a tire tread impression. That is my opinion. All right, now I see you have a number of arrows here that have different colors and so I'd like to move through those and you explain what you're pointing to with those arrows in this image, okay? Absolutely. Let's start with the, uh, the baby blue one and tell, tell the jury what, what that indicates to you. Now you're gonna have to tell me because I can't tell shade from up here. Right. Okay, the top one. Yep. Yes, sir. All right, here you've got your unknown impression. Let me see down there. Here you got your unknown impression. And what I've pointed here is at the start of that impression, and it's in mud, by the way. It, it's in mud, and so it's really, really fragile, but it's still here. You got an unknown impression, and here's approximately where it starts in the unknown, and here is where it starts in the known. And you can look at both the marked up one and the actual impression itself. All right, and it's here. All right, and then moving on to the to this this one right here, kind of uh, we got a purple one, and then uh, kind of that. Uh, Yes, sir. I see whatever it. that one is, but to explain yes, to the jury what you're seeing there and how that supports your conclusion. Right here is the other side of that tread. And this tread is this tread is this tread. They're, those two are the same. And right here, you can see it come up and it actually makes a complete corner there. Comes up and it curves out just a little bit there. All right. And it, is that consistent with the, with the sort of unique shape of that top tire? Tray? Yes, sir, it is. Uh, right here and then it comes up. Now, it's not, it's exaggerated a little bit in the drawing, but that's the best I could do with a, with a stylist trying to get it there. Right. And are those very distinct patterns that you see in the mud that match up with that particular tire? Yes, tray? sir. Not so much, uh, not so much the corner there. But these in here are, you can see a unique random characteristic here. And all that is is a void pattern in the mud. You can also see it 
here. I mean, almost perfect. You can see one here where the yellow area is. You can see it here. It's right there. All right, you're kind of doing a little mountain or a little hump. And expand on that with the jury. Why is that particular, why is that significant to you? Because that's not in the, that, that's not in the process of making the tire. That's because whoever drove that side by side last hit some dirt or some mud, and that is a pattern that's left in mud on the tire. And in my opinion, it transferred to Miss Maggie Murdoch's calf. All right, and show the jury where you're talking about the little hop on yes, this sir. image right here, if you could show it. In it's the... marked with a yellow arrow, mm -hmm. and here it is, right here. And I've marked it there, but you can look at the one that's not marked, and you can also see it here. All right, talking about uh, this bottom uh, impression, we've got a white arrow to that line right there. Explain that to the jury, what's significant in your analysis about that. I mark that because unless you examine, you might, unless you got really, really good eyesight, you might not even pick up on that. But here, you've only got a partial line. The whole line didn't show through in the transfer of the mud or dirt or debris. And I, I kept myself honest. I only highlighted the length of that, but you can also, See it here and here. You can see that that side of that tread, that tire tread. All right. And uh, moving on now to uh, to the uh, this green one right here, and kind of green uh, to the baby blue to that blue, just kind of going around there. If you could explain that to the jury and its significance, if any, to your analysis. It's just a continuation, and there's a little break in there, but they're still the same angle, same lines, and they match up, and that's just because the, the dirt didn't transfer completely. But you got plenty of skeletonized line here to show the outline of that tread here, here, and here, and that's here, here, and here. In your opinion, that's a tire impression, is that That correct? is a tire impression, that's my opinion. And in, in your opinion, based on these very significant uh, mirror images and accidentals and that sort of thing, is that most likely that specific tire tread that's on the back of It is cab? most likely that tire. If it's not that tire, it's a similar tire with the same tread design. And that particular tire was in close proximity to where Maggie was found, correct? In close proximity. Um, looking at how you had Maggie uh, in that first shot, I think you had me kind of angled a little bit like that. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And if she was angled that way near that front tire, would she be facing towards the feed room? Yes, sir. All right. And are those two shots that, that were suffered in the abdomen and the thigh, are those uh, consistent with the shooter coming from the direction of the feed room? Basically? Certainly could be. Yes, sir. All right. Go ahead and have a seat for me if you would. Sure, I'll have you back up. Uh, additionally, with this uh, particular tire tread impression on the back of, uh, of Maggie's calf, is that consistent with her running into it or backing up into it with her, uh, with her calf hitting that tire as it was parked? Weeding, um, I have not, this is my first weeding objection on this, but I, I object weeding. I'll replace your All right. Uh, with, uh, what, let me ask you this. With this particular tire impression and what you see on Maggie's calf, is there a reasonable explanation as to how that uh, impression got on her calf? At some point in time, Miss Maggie Murdoch's left calf made contact with the inside of that front driver's side tire or one just like it, and I saw no evidence that she was run over. So she had to make contact at some point in time. Gotcha. All right. Um, Hold on for me one second. I've just got a few more matters.
be careful. This one will be under seal. So can we secure the monitors, please? I'm going to show you what's been marked as 542 and see if you recognize this image. I do. All right, and just generally tell the jury what that is. It's a cell phone sitting up on the back right-hand side pocket of the victim, Paul Murdoch. Your Honor, this time I'd move uh, states 542 into evidence under seal. That's admitted. All right, are the monitors secured? And I'm going to put this image up on the screen. Is this your understanding of uh, how Paul's phone was found at the crime scene? It is. All right. And did you uh, make any assessment or analysis of whether or not Paul's phone could have popped out and be found in that position? I did. All right. And can you relate that to the jury, please? It's my opinion that his, his phone was placed there by someone else. And tell the jury your basis for that conclusion, please. Well, after I mentioned the, the fatality, the fatal shot, uh, at that point in time, you have no movement, even involuntary movement, and there's no way Paul could have retrieved that phone from his pocket and placed it on top his the back of his pants. And in your opinion, if he had been carrying that in his hand, could it have landed in that fashion following the fatal shot he suffered to his head? Mathematically, you may could have made it happen, but I don't believe it's possible. I believe the phone would have fell to the ground and it wouldn't have fell behind him up in the air and landed on him. A couple other things. Uh, you've testified about your experience in crime scene and that sort of thing, is that correct? Yes, sir. Uh, is there any forensic value in a residence uh, belonging to certain family members and doing any sort of DNA swabs of the bathroom sink or the shower drain or anything like that? If it's an unknown person, maybe, but not if someone lives there. I see, I see very little forensic value in that. And why is that? Can you explain that to the jury? Because, because we as humans, we, we swap, we lose biological material every day. We brush our teeth or we should, we brush our teeth and we shampoo and we wash and there's commonly blood and other bodily fluids in our drains, in our tub drains, and generally everywhere except in the toilet bowl. Generally? Generally, yes sir, under black light. 